Hello everyone, um, welcome to day five of Advent of Code 2019 in Rust. Um, we have a fun day today. Uh, day five is um, another problem with the computer that we got to build in day two. Um, and I find these problems super interesting. I love thinking about, uh, I, I like emulation and thinking about how computers work. So I, I, find, I found today's problem really interesting. Um, so, if you uh, just stumbled on this video but haven't seen the previous four, this is part of a series where we're coding uh, all the problems of Advent of Code uh, 2019 in Rust. So, days one through four are already up on YouTube, um, and you can find them here. And the code uh, that we're writing is on my GitHub page in this repo, uh, BC Myers AOC 2019. Um, so if you're just joining in for this, um, you might want to go back and watch the others uh, first to get caught up. But um, with that, let's sort of dive into what I wanted to talk about today. So uh, I have a short to-do list. We're mostly just going to do day three. Um, but I thought I would revisit real quick um, yesterday's solution, day four, because, well, I feel silly. I, I fooled around with how... <laughs> how you can take uh, like a U size number and parse it into its individual digits. Um, and I, I figured out a way to do that, but it's clearly not the best solution. And I just want to show off the best solution and feel embarrassed. Um, so let's do that real quick. Um, and then after that, I, I have a comment I want to make about Inferno because somebody mentioned it in the YouTube comments for yesterday's video. Um, and then we'll start in on day three. So if you guys remember yesterday in day four, we have this function called parse digits where we were given a number, like a six digit number, one, like one, two, three, four, five, six. And this function's job is to turn it into an array of bytes that looks like this, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and so this solution works. Um, you sort of, five times in a row, you uh, take your number and divide by 10 times well, divide by one the first time, then 10 the second time, then 100 the third time, 1,000 the fourth time, etc. And then do this line and then do the subtraction, but there's a much, much better way to do this. Um, so uh, here is an equivalent. Uh, this gives you an equivalent answer, but I'm sure it's more efficient and faster. So let's just do a loop. And let's say we have an index variable, which we initialize to five. And the array um, in the fifth spot, because this doing things is going to get us first six, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one. So the last digit is just this is just so simple. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. And I've seen this before. It's I, I feel really silly. Um, but just take n and mod ten. <laughs> That's the last digit. Um, and then when you go around the loop again, you want to get rid of uh, that last digit. And so you can do that by just making n uh, be n divided by 10. So if it's if we start out as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, after we do that divide by 10, we'll end up with 1, 3, 3, 4, 5. And so coming around the second time in the loop, n mod 10 will now be 5. And then we'll tack off another digit. I mean, this is just a super simple way to... Uh, to parse digits. Um, so every time around the loop, we are going to uh, decrement i. And if we ever find that i is 0, then we can break. Um, so I'm going to replace this little bit of code uh, that we wrote before with this loop now. Um, but let's make sure it works and the tests all pass and then I will move on to, uh, to day three. And it needs to be mutable because we're mutating it. There we go. So let's see if given this new replacement for this for loop, everything works. It does not work. Oh, because I hard coded five. Sorry, output of i. 
perfect. So we're going to be using this sort of technique again today. Um, so if you didn't sort of get this or it's a little bit foreign to you, we'll, we'll do it again in the problem for um, day five. But I just wanted to make that change and also just say I'm an idiot because uh, it's very, very simple to pull off the last digit of a number, just mod by 10. <laughs> okay, um, so that's that. And the only other thing I want to do real quick before we jump into day three is mention uh, Inferno. So um, I had talked about this on another stream, an earlier stream, but if you go to uh, John Hu's GitHub, um, he works on a repository called Inferno, which is a port of FlameGraph to Rust. Um, and you, there are many different sort of tools you can use to profile your code. Um, I think at the moment FlameGraph works with, or sorry, FlameGraph works with a whole bunch of them. That's the original program written in Perl. Inferno for the moment works with Dtrace, Guess, Perf, Sample, and Vtune. Um, and so if you run any of those profilers uh, on your code, you can take the output of that and pump it through uh, the various utilities that the various binaries in this Inferno uh, repository, and you'll get a pretty flame graph that shows you these are this is the call stack of your program um, and the time that each of these functions is taking inside your program. So it's a really good way to sort of profile code and figure out what's taking the longest time and if you want to make it faster where you should focus. Um, and so uh, I mentioned, I replied to, somebody mentioned this in a YouTube comment and asked if we were going to do flame graph on our code or Inferno. Um, and I said yes. Uh, so we will do that eventually, um, but not today. Today I want to focus on number three, but I just thought I would uh, mention that this is a cool tool and maybe we'll show it off one day. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about Inferno. And now we can just go to day three. Um, so day three is, or sorry, uh, day three, not day three, day five. Day five, we can go to day five. Um, so day five is a really cool problem. Let's dive into it. So we get to work with our, our, our computer again. Um, except for now, we have to modify our computer to be more powerful. Um, so we need to add two new instructions to our computer. If you guys remember from day two, um, our computer now handles three instructions. We have an add instruction, which is opcode number one. We have a multiply instruction, which is opcode number two. And we have a halt instruction, which is opcode 99. So apparently now we need to add opcode three, which uh, is going to pop a value off of an input vector that we also need to add to our computer. So our, our computer is going to take uh, a vector of inputs and if you hit opcode three, um, we need to pop a value off that input vector and store it in the address that is the operand of this opcode. The next opcode we need to add is number four, which uh, takes, we, our computer is gonna have a separate output vector, so we need to add two new sort of pieces of state to our vector, an input vector and an output vector. We're gonna have another output vector, and every time this opcode comes up, uh, you are just going to take the value of the operand and put it into the output vector. Um, so that's fairly simple, but we get to do add two new opcodes. And then the really interesting part is we are now changing our, our addressing modes, or what they call parameter modes, but I think it's more commonly called addressing modes. Um, but as you recall, uh, in day two, when we had, say, the add instruction, um, the First we read the opcode for the add instruction, and then the next number that the computer read was the first uh, sort of argument that we're gonna put, that we're gonna add together with the second argument. But those arguments were not the actual numbers we're adding, they were pointers to the place in memory where we could find the value that we needed to add. So this addressing uh, type is, I, th I think it's typically called direct addressing. I could be wrong about that. Um, but our computer was doing direct addressing previously, but now we're going to add the ability for it to do immediate addressing. And immediate addressing just says, um, hey, this is the, the, the number that you're looking at 
uh, for the operand is not a pointer to someplace in memory. It's just the value you should use. So if we ran into the opcode one for add, and then we had right after that another one, and then right after that another one, and we were in immediate addressing mode for both operands, then that would tell us we need to take one and add one to it and get two. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Um, basically that's that's all we need to do for part one is add uh, two new opcodes and rework our computer to work in both um, immediate mode addressing and direct mode. Um, oh, and uh, it's also interesting. We need to know how how do we figure out whether or not we should read an operand as immediate mode addressing or direct mode addressing? Well, I'm glad you asked because that is explained. I forget what that is explained. I don't like reading this text, but I'll explain it just uh, with my voice. So um, the opcode, previously, um, the sort of integer that we read in is the opcode. We just read as an opcode, but it is actually now going to store two pieces of information. The first, the lower, the first two digits going from right to left. The first two digits are going to be interpreted just as we've been interpreting them before as an as an opcode. But every digit after that, again going from right to left, is going to tell you the addressing mode that you're supposed to use for the arguments. So take our add instruction. Our add instruction has three uh, arguments or operands. Right? It has, uh, I, I think I was calling them A, and then B, and then W, right? So uh, we add A and B together, and we write it to W. So um, zero is going to represent the uh, direct addressing mode like we've been doing, but one is going to represent this new immediate mode. And so if we ha ran into an opcode that would say 1101, well, we would interpret that as um, 0, 1 would be the uh, opcode. So we'd say, this is an add instruction. But then uh, the 1, 1 at the beginning would tell us that for both the A parameter and the second B parameter, we need to get those using immediate addressing mode, not uh, using direct addressing mode like we were before. And so that's the way uh, in this sort of uh, assembly language um, the immediate and, or the addressing modes are encoded. So I think that explains everything about the problem. So let's just sort of dive in and start coding it up. Um, I am going to, I think we might have to use the computer even more uh, than we have been. And so I'm going to um, sort of abstract it out into its own file and make it a little bit more robust um, to maybe being modified in the future. Take a drink of coffee. All right, so let's do that. Let's add a file called computer. Um, let's go into day two and grab our computer. Uh, come on, grab the computer and pull it into this file. And we'll pull the tests in as well. Uh, so there's our computer. We need to add this module to our library. So uh, not pub, just mod computer. All right. Let's go into computer because we're going to miss. We're going to be missing all kinds of imports. What do we need? We need uh, error and I/O, and that might be it. So use standard I/O and use create error error. Good. Um, now let's go back into day two, and in day two we will use create computer computer and computer is private so we need to make it pub crate and we need to make its functions pub crate as well and I think in the tests uh, yeah we're accessing the We're accessing the RAM here, um, but I don't want that to be a public field, even though it's going to be fine in this test thing because this is a sub-module of our computer module. Let's make a little sort of getter method on computer that gives us um, a 
view into the RAM as opposed to accessing the fields directly. So let's say pub, uh, sure, pub create function RAM self and give us a view into the, what are these, i32s? No, U sizes. Interesting. We're going to have to change that, by the way, because now um, our computer can deal with negative numbers. Uh, so this is self.ram. Um, allow unused, because I'm only using a test right now, and I don't know if I'm going to use it ever again. Now we can't compare a U size with a vector, so let's do that. And that is now a reference to a vector, but we want actually a slice, so let's do that. Okay, so that should work, and everything should still be fine. We just move things around. Um, oh, I should mention something as well. So I, I, rearrange, I did a little bit of rearranging. I, told, I, I mentioned towards the end of the video I was going to do this. So remember we had two uh, solutions to day three? Well, we're keeping... The fast version that I didn't code live on stream, but is actually the first version that I actually built myself um, before I looked at anybody else's solutions, um, but was kind of a little bit more complicated to write. That is now just our regular day three solution. And the one that I coded live on stream, because uh, it was easier, that I got from other people's answers after I finished it on my own, um, that is now in this alternatives and is sort of not wired up at all. But it's still in the repo, it's just not wired up, and so uh, we just now have one day three. So I should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, so let's go back to our computer. All right, so we're gonna make a couple changes to our computer. First of all, in this new scenario, well, I'll show you with the input to our puzzle, this can now deal with negative numbers. That's a negative 37, I think. <coughs> and so actually our computer's memory is gonna be filled with uh, signed integers. And I decided to make, let's make a 64-bit machine and be explicit about how many, uh, how many bytes our, our pointers and our machine and our values can take. So let's take care of this and change all of the, uh, change all of these values. We need to parse this into i64s, um, the nouns and verbs need to be i64s, uh, as u size. Well, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna, this is all gonna be gone. So let's just delete it. This is going to return an I64. And this is now a slice of I64s. And this is now got to be interpreted as I64s. And I think that works. Our tests will obviously no longer pass, but we should compile. So let's uh, just cargo check. Good. All right. So in order to do this properly, we're going to need several abstractions. So let's first um, abstract out the idea of an instruction. So pub enum instruction, because we're going to have many more of these today. In part two, we get to add even more than the two that we were talking about before. So remember from last time, we had an add instruction that took an A. Um, which is an I-64. It took a B, which is an I-64. And it took a pointer to write to, which is going to be a U-64 because pointers in the memory cannot be negative. Same with multiply. Um, multiply basically takes the same kinds of arguments as add does. Multiply. Then we had our halt instruction, which takes no arguments. 
But today we're going to add, uh, in the first part, we're going to add input. And input takes, um, is it, it takes a place to write something from the input vector 2. And then output takes a place from memory that we are going to write to in we are going to write our output to. So it takes an I64. Um, so for the moment, these are our four instructions. That's correct. Okay. Um, where do I want to go to next? Oh, I also want to be a lot clearer about how we're writing to and reading to memory. And so I'm going to abstract out the idea of memory by creating a trait called memory. And it's going to have two methods that we need to implement on the type. Well, we're going to implement it on a vector. It's going to have a read method, which uh, just takes a reference to self and has and a pointer which is a U64, and it returns a result of the value at that address in memory and an error. So that is going to be the first method that we need to implement on reader. The second method is write, which is going to take a mutable reference to a memory and a pointer and a value which is an I64, and it is going to return a result of unit or error. So these are the uh, these are the two sort of core methods I want in the memory trait, and then we're going to implement memory for vec of I64, which is what our RAM is in the computer. So let's do that. So if we read, steal the signature from up here. To read memory, we just say self dot get at the pointer as u size, um, and this can this returns an option. So if we don't find it, we want to say. Um, unable to read memory at location where and unwrap. This is our value and clearly we can return, we can just return. It. Um, but this returns a reference so let's dereference that because this is, uh, I want to OK or else takes a closure. And this needs to be an error. There we go. So now we're just missing the write method on our memory. So it takes me itself, pointer, the U64, a value, I64, and it returns a result of nothing or an error and here all we're going to do is say self.getMute at the pointer as u size uh, this can be nothing so we say ok or else error um, out of bounds error uh, unable to write to memory location this pointer question mark so this will hand us back a mutable reference to the value and then we just take dereference that reference and we set it equal to val and we turn ok unit um, and this is also an out of bounds error so let's say out of bounds error unable to read memory at location this ok 
So there are read and write methods on memory. Um, all right. Now let's talk about, this does not need to be public, but it should be copy and clone and debug and eek and partial eek and hash. Why not? Um, okay, let's talk about our strategy. Uh, so we are going to in execute. Well, I guess first of all, we need to add some state to our computer. So our computer is now going to have an input vector that you give it uh, when uh, you want to run a program. So it is a vector of I64s. It's also going to have an output vector that it can write to. So remember one of the instructions, instruction four, writes to an output vector. So that is a vector of I64s. Uh, we still have our ROM, our RAM, and our program counter. Now, so when we create the, vec uh, the computer, we need to initialize input and output to just empty uh, vectors. But then in execute here, so in day two, uh, in order to execute a program, you had to give it this noun and the verb. Um, in this day, we need to give it a vector, uh, an input vector. So um, I'll actually abstract this later and show you guys the builder pattern. Not because, again, it's totally overkill for this, but um, it'd just be interesting. I just want to show off interesting Rust things, and um, I don't like it that this has to take uh, three parameters like this, some of all of which are going to be optional, as you'll see. So we might turn this into a builder later. Um, so, but anyway, um, to make this compatible with day two, where we don't pass an input vector, let's make this take an option of a vec of i64s for input and in order to make it compatible with day five which doesn't need a noun and a verb for the moment again we're going to probably fix this later let's make these take make running the program take an option of noun and verb um, I guess you need both of these at the same time so noun and verb. So this needs to be a tuple of I64s. All right, so those are the inputs to our function now. Um, and let's see, we still want to, this is reset state every time we want to execute. Um, and now we, uh, need to uh, set inputs and that is going to be done like this now if let some input equals input then self dot input equals input and if let some noun verb equals noun noun and verb verb then self dot noun equals oh no not self dot noun self dot ram one is the noun and self dot ram two is the verb okay so that takes care of resetting our state Oh, not quite, because now we have output, which is going to be mutated. So we want to initialize that every time we run it to a brand new vector as well. So now this resets our state. Um, o, P, Q, R, uh, alphabetical, because why not? Um, and we set our inputs, and now we're ready to execute the program. So the way I want to do this, uh, again, to kind of clean things up and make it simpler, is I want to say let uh, instruction equals self dot read instruction, which can fail, probably. And then I want to say self dot execute instruction and pass it the instruction, which can also probably fail. And 
that is it. Um, and so all of today will basically be creating these two methods. Um, so uh, these don't need to be public. Function um, read instruction, which takes nothing and returns a result of an instruction and an error. And it is to do. And execute instruction. Execute instruction. Takes an instruction and returns a result of nothing and error. And it is also to do. And we'll put unimplemented now. Because we're not going to work on this one yet. We're going to work on this one. Um, oh, and these need to take, uh, let's see, this needs to take app new self, and this needs to take, I think, just at self, but I'm not sure. No, it needs to take app new self as well. Okay. Um, mismatch types expected, oh yes. Uh, let's just say unimplemented on this one as well. I don't like it when there's red. Uh, okay, so we want to read an instruction. Um, and remember, I, I guess, let me explain this here. Or let's look at the input. Let's pull in the input for day five um, and look at it as an example of what's going to happen. So we need to add... Uh, 05.txt and 05.txt is this is our program. Let's quit out of that. Oh, I didn't really need to quit out of that, but let's quit out of that and come back here and cat out on the right hand side data.05.txt. All right, so if you recall what's happening here, um, we read an opcode. In this case, it happens to be three, which is the input opcode. So this says, hey, take the next thing and write it to our input. Um, but since this is just three and not one zero three, we're in pointer address or direct addressing. So this means go find the thing at slot number 225 in memory and write that to our input vector. No. Uh, what is number three? How does input work? Opco three takes a single integer as input and saves it to the position given by its only parameter. Oh yeah. So three three what three three does is we're gonna have an input vector. And it's going to pop off a value from that input vector and save it in memory at location 225, somewhere down here. And then we're done with this instruction. And then we move to this instruction, which is 1, so it's add, and it's going to have three operands. And so, again, because it's not 1101, it's just plain 1, it is going to be like the add instruction we did last time where everything's in direct mode. So what it's doing is saying, go look in memory address 225, which is where we just stored our input. Pull that value in. Go look in memory address six, which I guess is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, add those two numbers together and store it in add in store it in six, which is there. And so this is actually going to change. So we don't know what's going to happen now, uh, or I mean, we follow it, but. The next uh, opcode we read is may have be updated from that. So anyway, um, that's just sort of to help recall how this sort of computer works. And notice, by the way, before we could count on the fact that every opcode um, took uh, took three operands, and so every time we did an opcode, we just incremented our program counter by four. But now we have uh, opcodes that this opcode only takes one operand. Um, this one takes four. We're going to add some later that take three. 
And so we need to pay attention that we can no longer, our, our updating the program counter is going to be variable. Um, all right. And we also have to deal with this addressing mode business, but let's actually, we'll talk about that soon. Um, so when we first start up, right, we are going to um, read our memory at the program counter, which is going to be initialized to zero. And that is going to give us a number. And that number is going to be something like 1102. Um, and what we need to do with this number is the first two digits we need to interpret as the opcode. And these last digits we need to interpret as the addressing modes for the operands. And so here's where I said we're going to use this sort of the, the, the parse inputs, the parse digits thing that we talked about, that I talked about at the beginning of the stream. We're going to use that again here. So what we want to do is we're going to say the ones uh, digit is in mod 10. Um, and then we will lop that off. So in uh, divided equals 10, which means this needs to be beautiful. So now we have pulled in two and we've lopped it off. So now we, we're left with this. Um, so the tens digit, we don't have any opcodes that are above, t well I guess we do, we have the halt which is 99, is lopping off another digit and we decrease again. So now we got this. And now this is going to tell us the addressing modes uh, for all of our operands. Um, so if this does not exist, so if there are no numbers here, right, uh, then uh, you should interpret it as zero, which is the pointer addressing mode. Um, so let's say let's say we have this, you know, we have this. This is our opcode: um, one zero one, and then our operand is five and ten. And uh, the place we're writing to is address 55. Um, so this says, um, add these two numbers together, but interpret the first one as an immediate value. So actually use 5. The second one, however, because there's an implied 0 there, we're going to interpret as an address. So what this is saying is add 5 to whatever is at address 10 and write it out to address 55. So the way I thought about doing this, uh, getting these modes, these addressing modes out, now that we've lopped our instruction, we've lopped the two, the right, mo the two rightmost digits off of our opcode, off of this number to get our opcode. So we know what our opcode is right now. Our opcode is uh, the tens digit that we pulled out times ten plus the ones digit. So that is our opcode. But how do we get these addressing modes? Well, I thought this was a neat way to do it, and we can show off iterators in Rust. So, well, first of all, we have two we have two modes. So let's do that first. We have a mode that is um, the the direct mode. Well, let's call it. I think it's clear to call it the pointer mode. That's probably that's definitely not the right language for it, but it makes more sense to me. And then we have immediate mode. Um, immediate. Immediate. Immediate mode. There we go. Um, but what I want to create is I want to create something called modes, which is going to hold a U64, and it is going to implement implement iterator. Um, and iterator is a trait that requires two things, and then it gives you all kinds of magic. Um, it requires an associated type called item, which is the item you are going to output after every iteration of uh, after after every iteration, yeah, after every iteration of this iterator. And for us, we want this to be a result of a mode or an error. And then it requires you to implement the next function, which takes a mutable reference to self and returns a an option of whatever you said your associated type was. Uh, so in our case, I mean, I could, instead of writing self.item here, I, I could write result of mode error. 
Um, but I always like to write it like this because then I only have to change it. If I ever change it, I only have to change it in one place and it will automatically sort of update here. All right. So this next method, what we want to do, um, let me maybe I should explain this better up here. So we're going to create a modes up here with the in that's left over. So remember, we start out, let's say, at with 1101, and then we have lopped off the first two. So now in is just 11. And that is what we're going to pass into modes. And so every time modes, uh, every time modes goes through an iteration, we want to say that the mode is mode try from uh, in self dot zero, which is the in up here that we pass in is going to be self dot zero because this is a tuple struct. Self dot zero mod ten. So lop off another digit from in, right? And try and parse that into a mode, which can fail. Um, so if it fails, then this iterator needs to return. Well, if it's okay, then we got a mode. If it fails, then we need to return some error e. All right. And then after we do that, we're going to take self.0 and we are going to lop off another digit. Um, which reminds me, the first thing we want to check is if we've lopped off all the digits and self.0 is actually equal to zero. Uh, well, no, match, match on self dot zero. So if self dot zero is zero, that means we've used up this entire number. And um, but remember, it's implied. So I don't know if I explained this correctly. It's implied that if if you sort of run out of a number, then uh, you just use uh, addressing mode zero. And so what we want to do is not return none. In fact, this iterator should never stop. Um, we want to just return sum of OK of mode uh, pointer, which is the default mode. If, however, we have self.0 is some number, right, then we want to do all this business where we try and parse that number into a mode. Um, and if we got that mode, mismatch types. Why are you not letting me? Why are you not formatting? All right. Go there. Go there. Go there. Go there. Come back down here. This matches. This matches. Oh, we want to return this in this case. But that's still not helping. Um, and then we want to return in this case some OK mode. Perfect. OK. So again, to kind of explain this code, right, what, what we when we create a mode, it's going to be just the things we need to interpret as addressing modes. Um, if this number is zero, it means like we're done and we just always return the default mode of pointer. If however, we have some number in here, like say one one, then we get the first digit, try and parse it into a mode, which can fail. If it fails, we give an error back. If it doesn't fail, we actually lop that digit off of our state using this 
and then we return the mode that we created. So hopefully that is all clear. Uh, but it's a nice sort of, I think it's a nice example of how you can create your own iterator in Rust to do something pretty simple. Um, so now what we need to do is on mode, we need to know how to parse a number into a mode. So let's implement try from, uh, we're going to get uh, u64 and we want to turn that into a mode, a for mode. So function try from in u64, give us a result of result of ourselves because we're in mode or our associated error type which I forgot to put here and now we try and parse ourselves uh, parse the end so let's match on in if in is zero that means we are in mode pointer which is the default if in is one we are in mode immediate and if n is anything else then we need to say unrecognized unrecognized addressing mode whatever n is and this is our output and in those the zero and the one case our output is good so we say okay and that should work, except for we haven't imported try from. So use standard convert try from. Uh, not stir convert, standard convert. OK. So what am I missing? It, it looks like I actually did this correctly. So we have our mode. We can parse a number into a mode, and we have our iterator, which is going to take uh, the rest of the number after we've lopped off the opcode, and it is going to be something that when we call next on it will just give us the next mode, which is what we want. Um, so this needs to be as u64. Um, Actually, we, this is how we were reading data from memory, but now we want to read data from memory differently, don't we? We want to use the uh, memory trait that we made. So we want to read at self.pc, and that can fail. And so now reading memory looks like this. And it is safer and checks error bounds and all this kind of stuff. Mm. We read this on our RAM, self.ram.read. Right? Okay. Uh, so this is opcode, and this is going to be need to be mutable later. Modes is all this business, um, and this business, and is this. All right. Um, oh, and our modes are definitely going to be a U64. In fact, if we get an opcode that's negative, that is no bueno, right? So we should say if n is less than zero, then bail and say um, like uh, red negative opcode, which is not allowed. Uh, negative opcode. This. And this is in. And so now we can treat, we can say let mute in equals in as u64. Because we know that it is not negative and this We'll never lose any information because U64 can hold way more positive numbers, while well, twice as many positive numbers as an I64 can. So then we got our in, uh, we get our ones digit, we get our tens digit, we turn that into an opcode. The rest of the stuff 
um, after that's been locked off by these two lines, uh, we turn into a modes, um, our new iterator, and then we return all these things. So that is uh, opcode and modes done and dusted. And actually, to sort of make this prettier, I want to go down on our memory struct, our, our memory trait, and we will implement a provided method called read opcode on memory, which will return us our opcode and a modes. And this can fail. And we don't need that anymore. And this needs to be OK. And in order to do this, we need to pass in Oh, we need to pass an immutable reference to the point uh, to the program counter. So hold on, program counter, mutable reference to a uh, U64, um, and then we need to read at this program counter. But after we read, we want to increment our program counter. So program counter plus equals one, right? Because we're done with having we've read this byte. Um, and this is now not self.ram, this is self.read. And so now we have on our memory trait, we have a read opcode method that if we ever implement memory on any other type except for VEC, uh, VEC of I3, I64, which we've done down here, we don't need to implement it. This is an automatic method that we get for free um, without having to do it for every single type. Um, all right, so now up here we can call, instead of doing all this business, we can just say let opcode mute modes equals self dot ram, because that's what implements memory, dot read opcode, and we need to pass it in a mutable reference to the program counter. And this can fail, and semicolon, and that is interpreting the opcode and the modes all done. All right, so now that we have the opcode, we can match on it, and this will tell us what kind of instruction we need to create. So if we get a one, then we need to create an instruction, uh, which needs an A, question, 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 it needs a B, question, 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 it needs a W. If we get a two, oops, this is add, if we get a two, it's a multiply. If we get a three, it's a input. If we get a four, it's an output instruction. <coughs> Excuse me. Hold on. Ooh. Instruction equals. And if we get a sorry, this should be a four. And if we get a ninety-nine then this needs to be a halt instruction, which looks like that. Um, OK, so now we just need to figure out uh, how to parse out the A's and the B's and the W's and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so what I want to do here is I want to take our memory. Uh, remember, we updated the program counter here already. So now we're looking, our program counter is pointing to uh, the right spot, the first operand. So let's take our memory, self.ram, and let us uh, read a signed integer from the memory. In order to do that, we need to give it a mutable reference to our program counter, because that will have to be updated, because once we read this operand, we need to move the program counter. And we also need to know what addressing mode to use in order to get this A parameter. And so this is where the modes um, iterator comes in, is we will just pass this a mutable reference to modes. 
Um, and so that is how we are going to read in our operands. And we can do the same thing for b. We can say self.ram.read uh, signed. Give it a mutable reference to the program counter and a mutable reference to modes. Um, and for w, we can do the same thing, except for when you write to something, there's, it's mentioned down here somewhere. When you write, when you you have a parameter that is something that you use to write, uh, that tells you where you need to write things, this will never be in immediate mode. Uh, so we don't need to pass a mode uh, to the function that gets us the w parameter. I'm going to call this function read pointer, and all it needs to do is read the next integer and update the program counter. And so there are the three things that we need to do to read in A, read in B, read in W, and create the add instruction if indeed the opcode turned out to be 1. And all of these things are going to be able to fail. And that's how I want to do reading in the instructions. So let's copy this and make it 2 because multiply is the exact same thing except for it's called multiply and then let's copy this again because uh, it's faster to do that and for input uh, input takes does it take a W where you write the input to? yeah so it takes a W where you write the input to because we're going to pop something off the input and we're going to write it into memory so all we need here is a W. Um, for output, we need an A, which is going to be a signed integer. So it's going to need at mute modes as well. Uh, instruction should have output. Why does instruction not have output? Because I spelled it wrong. Output. Output. There we go. Uh, let's see. All right. And for the halt instruction, we don't need to do anything. We just need to create a halt because it has no. It has no inner inner type. Um, and then from this function we can just return OK instruction and that is for the moment I think this entire function done but we need to uh, create these methods on memory but that should be fairly easy to do uh, in instruction there we go. Okay. So let's go back down to our memory uh, trait. And we need to add two methods read signed, which we said takes, and I'm going to reorder these parameters actually. It, so it takes a it takes just a, a immutable reference because we don't need to update the memory. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to reorder these because I like everything to be in uh, alphabetical order. It also is going to take a modes, which is a mutable reference to our modes iterator, and it's going to take a program counter, which is a mutable reference to a U64, and it is going to return us an I64 and possibly an error, and we'll say unimplemented. And then the other um, function we need. Uh, on this trait, the other method we need on this trait is read pointer, which takes a self, does not take a modes, but takes a PC and returns pointers are always going to be U64s, should always be U64s. So uh, now that we have those two things sort of created up here, it should not yell at us anymore, except for the fact that I put all of this stuff in the wrong order. So at mute self dot pc in fact let's let's do this 
You guys have watched me be very inefficient with them. Apologies. Uh, do I do it there or there? There. No. That did not work. Alright. Copy. Uh, paste. Oh, hey. Okay. Um, paste. Alright. Uh, paste. Alright. <laughs> um, and now delete you. And delete you. And delete you. And delete you. And so now this function is all nice and clean and ready to go, I think. Um, so now all we need to do is implement read signed and read pointer. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So read signed, right? What we're gonna do is get the mode back, uh, the mode out of this iterator. So modes.next, which returns an option, but remember how we built modes, it will never ever return none. Because if it ex if it exhausts everything, it's just always going to return some of the default. So we can safely unwrap here, um, because we know we're always going to get a mode out. Um, but we returned uh, this iterator returns uh, the associated item type as a result. So we need to unwrap here. Um, but that's our mode, and we need to match on our mode. And if we're in mode uh, immediate, that's the easiest, because what we do there, well, let's pull this out first. Okay, so let's say a value is self read. We want to read at the program counter, right? And then we will Increment the program counter because I don't want I don't want to forget to do that. All right, so this gives us the value, or well, the thing that's at memory where we are. So if we're in immediate mode, that's just what we want to return. We want to return OK of this value. If, however, we're in what do I call it pointer mode, then we need to interpret this value as a pointer. So that means we need to dive into memory again and get out val. Uh, this, by the way, can fail. Um, and this is our new value. I should probably call it something else, like val2. And it is, in the, it is this that we want to return from the function. So this doesn't need to be returned. This can just be... Um, okay. But mismatch types, because when we pull something out of memory here, this is an I64, or this is an, un, this is a signed number. Um, but if we're, if it's being treated as a pointer, it cannot be negative. So we need to say if val is less than zero, then that is no good. No bueno. Because you are um, attempting, or like um, encountered negative pointer, which is not allowed. And the pointer that we encountered is val. So now that we know this number is not negative, we can safely say as u64. And that is read signs, all done. I think. Now read pointer is even easier because we always interpret, um, we, 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 it's basically saying like we're always in immediate mode with the pointer, right? So all we have to do here is say, get the value, increment the program counter, return the value. Um, oh, but this value, right, uh, if, if the value is negative, then we're also no bueno, right? So bail, actually we can use this same message. Uh, duh, duh, duh. But 
if it if we pass that, then this can be a U64, which is what we need to return. And that is read pointer all sort of done and dusted. And so now I think we have successfully read in the instructions and handled uh, interpreting which kind of addressing mode we should use for each operand of the instruction. So now the only thing left to do for part one is to implement execute instruction. So that is fairly simple. We match on the instruction that we have received. It is more verbose, but let's actually call it an instruction. And if we get an instruction add, we're going to have A, B, and W. And what we do with those is we just say we self.ram.write to W, A plus B, which can fail. But that's it. It's that simple. If, however, we have a multiply instruction, uh oh, mismatched types. Why am I? Oh, okay. If we have a mismatched type, sorry, if we have a multiply instruction, then we just return A and B multiplied by each other. If we have, or not return, we. we oh, I need to think about what I'm saying. We multiply A and B together and we write it to W. If we have an input instruction, input, then we will have a W and we write to W. We take our input and we pop something off. So this could be none if the input is empty. So we will say, we will turn that into an error and say error attempted to access access um, uh, an input value but uh, the input uh, uh, what's the right way to do it? input Attempted to uh, attempted to access input, but input vector was empty. Propagate that error. That gives us a value, right? And we write that value. W. Um, and if we have an output instruction, we will get, oops, some parameter. And all we do here is we say self dot output dot push a. And if we have a halt instruction, Then we return, oh, so this execute instruction, if we do this and we get a halt, we need to know uh, when to stop, right? So let's return a result of an option of unit. So if we return none from this function, we mean uh, we know that we are done executing the program and we need to stop. And in every other case, so let's return none here. And then in every other case, let's return sum of unit. Oh, and this needs to be okay none. And this needs to be okay of sum of unit. That way, up in our run function, or our execute function, right, 
uh, we can say if self.execute after we handle the error is none, then you need to break because all of this should be happening in a loop. So in a loop, we read an instruction, we execute that instruction. Um, if we get none, because that means we ran into halt, then we break and we exit and we return. And I could be wrong, but I think this might be everything for part one complete. Uh, let's try it and see if that works out. These tests no longer pass because this needs to be sum of a tuple. Uh, sum of a tuple of noun and verb. And the vector of inputs, we are not going to give it. So does that still work? Cargo test. No, not at all. Oh my gosh. Um, and that's because in day two, where we used our computer, we no longer using it correctly. So here, we want to not give it an input vector, but we do want to give it a noun and a verb. Uh, so that should work. And we also need to not give this an input vector, but give it a noun and a verb. And so let's see if that works now. Nope, we still have problems. Okay, so in 68 in the computer, we are not handling all of the match cases, which makes sense. Uh, oh, of course, because opcode can be bail unrecognized opcode opcode uh, opcode okay so are you happy now hey you're happy now uh, except we're not using this val2 why are we not using this val2 in 192 um we need to return val2. Why are we returning val? That's not right. All right, our computer works. Even though we completely gutted it and did everything again, it works with day two. Um, let us um, see if we can make it work with uh, day five. So I think with day five, am I still, yeah, this is still part one. We need to give it an input of one and run it and see if we get this answer. So let's make a day five because we don't have a day five yet. So add day five dot rs, add day five here in our main function add day five. You're gonna yell at me because you don't have a run function yet. But let us steal the run function signature and the imports here from day four and paste it there. And unimplemented. Now we have a run function. Um, we need to steal the parsing code. Oh no, we don't. Our, our computer parses the input. So we're good. Um, all we need to do is essentially do this, right? Uh, we need to get our computer. So use create computer computer. And we need to get we're not interested in the answer. What we're interested in is the output. So we need a way to access output on the computer. We don't have that yet. So if we come down here, uh, we can access our RAM. But for good measure, let's just also say we can access our input and we can access our output. Um, 
let's see, pub create input is input and pub create output is output. And since we're gonna use this, we don't need that. Um, IOR is in alphabetical order, <laughs> how I like it. And here we need to pass a vector, uh, sum vector that just has one in it. And we are not gonna do this noun and verb business. So we run our computer and let's print out the output, the computer dot output. And let's do our return okay foo to string bar to string so that you will not panic. Uh, all right, we have a computer, we give it our input, we execute a program with the input vector of just con that just contains one, and we look at our output state. Let's do cargo run, five day data, 05.txt. Hey, hey, we got the right answer. So uh, if you read it, it says like your output vector is going to contain a bunch of zeros, but the last value is what the answer is. We got 2845163, and indeed it's 2845163. So um, so that's good. Let us, uh, let us, let us, let us uh, make sure that we can, well, let's say computer.output.last. Uh, what, is, what is last return? Uh, an option. Uh, so match on last. If we get sum, this is uh, value, value. This is our answer one. And if we get none, this is a bail um, did not get any output. So now we can return answer one. Two string. Why are you yelling at me? Oh, semicolon. Alright, so now let's write it again. And answer one shows up where we want it to show up. Perfect. That's uh, number part one done. All right, uh, let me explain part two, which is pretty exciting. We have more instructions, but um, the way we've kind of architected our computer, they will be very fast to add. So we have four more instructions. Uh, we have opco number five, which is the jump if true instruction, which takes uh, two parameters. It looks at the first parameter, Again, uh, we don't know the addressing mode from this, so whatever addressing mode it uses, it gets out that first parameter in the correct way. And if that first parameter is non-zero, uh, then it sets the instruction pointer to the value of the second parameter. So it sets the program counter to whatever the second parameter is. If the first parameter was zero, then it does nothing. Jump is false is basically the same thing, except for it does the stuff when the parameter is zero. Less than says if the parameter is less than the second, if the first parameter is less than the second parameter, it puts a one in the position given by the third parameter. Otherwise, it puts a zero in that position. And equals does the same thing, except for it checks if the first parameter is equal to the second parameter. So um, this should be fairly easy to code up. Um, let us let us go to the computer and do that. So we've added some more instructions. Where are instructions? Are they down here? They are down here. We've got, they're gonna resemble more of that than anything else. One, two, three, four. We've got jump if true. We've got jump if false. We've got less than, and we've got uh, equals. 
so jump if true needs to take a first parameter, um, and that's it. So this just has an A, I think, which is going to be put into the program counter, so it's going to be an unsigned value. Uh, oh no, 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 no. If the first parameter is non-zero, it sets the instruction point of the value of the second parameter. Oh, okay, okay. So we need the second parameter is going to be something that could possibly be set in the instruction pointer, so that needs to be unsigned. This, however, can be the first parameter that we're checking against zero can be anything. Um, so jump if false is going to be the exact same thing. Um, and, oh, I called these P's. Yeah, let's call these P's. Because this is, this is if we, this is the thing that might be set to the program counter. So I'm calling it a P. All right, less than. Less than. If the first parameter is less than the second parameter, it stores one in the position given by the third parameter. Okay, so I think this is just A is I64, B is I64, and we're going to write to the third parameter, and so we want that to be a U64. And that means equals is also the same, and so I think this is how we want to code up our instructions. All right, so now we have these new instructions. Let's go up here and worry about reading them. So let's do this. One, two, three, four. All right, if it's five, or if it's a six, or if it's a seven, or if it's an eight, we now have instructions for you. So five is instruction jump if true. Uh, six is instruction jump if false. Seven is instruction less than. And eight is instruction equals. And let's see. Uh, so jump if true, A and pointer. So these take an A and a pointer. And these take an A and a B and a right. Okay. So we need... We need an A. Oops. We need an A and a pointer. We need an A and a pointer. We need an A and a B and a right. Um, but this pointer is going to be read unsigned. And this pointer is going to be read unsigned. And otherwise, this is good, I think. Why are you not formatting? Um, yeah, why are you not formatting? 170. What? How did that show up? Was I even modifying that? Okay. Um, all right. So we come back up here, and uh, indeed, this all works, except for we don't have a read unsigned method. But that's going to be super easy to add to our memory. Let's go down to memory and read unsigned will be the same thing as read signed, except for we'll get unsigned out. And really all we need to do is we need to say read signed uh, with modes and PC self dot this can fail that is our value and for unsigned all we need to do is say well if you're negative then that's a problem but otherwise you are all good as a u64 so bail um, read unsigned. Yeah, bail. Uh, um, I, I don't know. This error message is going to be terrible, but like uh, attempting uh, to or like. Found 
like reading an unsigned integer but found negative value. if val is less than zero. And that's read unsigned all done. And so this part is now complete. So you can see like once we sort of, the, all the abstraction layers that I added just makes it super easy to add extra instructions now, um, which is nice. So part two is, is, is really quick. Uh, so let's add the instructions to execute. Let's tell, it, tell our program how to execute these instructions. So we have jump if false, which has an A and a P, right? Oops. An A and a P. And it belongs here. And we do some stuff. And we also have now a jump if true. which takes an A and a P. We have a less than, which takes an A and a B and a W. And we have an equals, which takes an A and a B and a W. So if, in order to execute jump at false, uh, wait, why is that? This, this one should be jump at true. Let's keep them in order. Um, all right, if we have jump is true, uh, then we need to look at the first parameter, and if it's non-zero, we set the instruction pointer, the program counter is what I'm calling it, to the value from the second parameter. Otherwise, we do nothing. Okay, so if it's non-zero, so if A does not equal zero, then we set the program counter to equal P. And that's that done. This one is if a equals zero, then we set the program counter to p. So that one's that that's that done. All right, less than. For less than, if the first parameter is less than the second parameter, so if a is less than b, then we store one in w. Otherwise, we store zero in w. So we do. Uh, self dot ram dot write to w one in this case right yep which can fail otherwise we self dot ram dot write into w zero and that's less than done and I think equals is the exact same thing except for instead of a less than b it's a equals b So if A equals B, if A, if the first parameter equal the second parameter, store one in the position given by the third parameter, otherwise store zero. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's all done. Um, let's see if our code still works uh, for part one. It does. And so part two, all we do is we run the computer again but this time we give it five as an input, I think. Um, and we still want the output. And this is no longer answer one, this is answer two. And so this is answer two. And we cannot borrow the computer as mutable because it is already borrowed as immutable. Because this, there you go. So let me explain that error. Um, all right. So here we're borrowing. Uh, here we're borrowing the computer uh, immutably, and it's returning us a reference to the vector, the output vector. Um, and then we call last on it, and we match. And so this is this is a reference to a value inside the computer. 
and we brought it out here so we still have a reference to the computer here an, an immutable reference to the computer here and we keep it all the way down here and then print it out um, and so if we have outstanding in this area right a, a read a, an immutable reference to the computer we cannot in rust because of borrowing borrow the computer mutably here but since this value we get out is copy right we just have to dereference uh, this reference and so now this is no longer a pointer or a reference that is tied to the computer it's just a straight up value and so um, because of uh, rust is smart enough to recognize that like we're no longer bar like once we do this right and we come out here we're no longer borrowing computer um, immutably anymore or sorry uh, yeah immutably anymore and so now we can borrow it mutably again uh, hopefully that made sense. All right, we get nine four three six two two nine, which I think is the right answer. Nine four three six two two nine, and there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That is that is uh, day five complete, and I really like this problem because I really like the computer. Um, we're, our our computer is resembling more and more. I mean, it's still not really like a computer, but it's it's sort of. It's got some of the basics of how computers actually work, right? We've got memory and uh, program counter and uh, input and output, and we've got, what, what is it, eight, nine different instructions now um, and two different addressing modes. Um, and so this is exciting, and I hope, uh, I hope some future problems will add some more uh, to our computer. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not very good at this stuff. Um, I, I, I tried a couple years ago when I was sort of brand new to coding, so maybe a year and a half ago, um, I sort of started making a half attempt to like write a basic Nintendo emulator. Um, and I did that for a while, uh, but then dropped the project because I got tired of it. Um, but I learned enough to like have this vocabulary um, of like addressing modes and stuff like that, and I think it's really neat. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's day five. And I guess we'll push to GitHub. Or we can add this to our benchmarks. I, I swear to God, I'm going to come up with a better way to do this at some point, but not right now. I said the same thing last night, but not, not, not last night, not right now. We're going to manually come in here and modify day four to day five all over the place. Um, oh, and there aren't really any good tests for this. I mean, maybe they are, but we're not going to add tests. We know our computer works for the moment. Oh, I did say I'd talk about the builder pattern. Maybe I should do that. I'll do that. Let's get uh, let's get our benches running. Cargo bench day five. Let's see if this works. It looks like it works. It's only going to take five seconds to run, which is good. There we go. So I don't know how fast this is supposed to go, but ours is taking 40 microseconds. So hopefully that is at least halfway decent. Um, but who knows? Um, all right. So, so, so. Yeah, the, the kind of pain in the ass thing that I don't like about our computer. The only thing I don't like about our computer right now, otherwise it's very pretty. Right, is this like thing that we did in order to make it so we could sort of run day two's projects and run day four's projects because our computer has kind of changed to take either an input of vectors or this sort of noun and verb type deal. And uh, so I don't know, this isn't how I actually do things, but let's just show you guys how to make a builder because it's a very good pattern in Rust. Um, so let us on the computer, right? Once we have a computer, uh, let's see. How would I want to structure this? So we have to give it. We have to give it a program, and we have to give it input or an out of verb. 
and we want to be able to run it multiple times. Well, no, because we want to run it multiple times. Let, let's not do this now. I'll, I'll think more about it. Um, like how you would structure an API to make this sort of better. Uh, but for right now, let's leave it like that. I'm sure we're going to be modifying the computer again, so we'll have a chance to come back and look at it. Um, let's make sure all our tests pass. They do. Uh, let's run day five. Let's just run, let's run day four. Oh, what we really need to run is day two. Let's run day two and make sure it still works. It still works. So let's run all our days. Day one, day two, we did day three, and we did day four, and we did day five. And so I think this is ready to commit to GitHub. So let's do git status. Uh, modified the benchmarks. Oh, uh, day one, two, uh, so I did some modifications to all of the days because um, Come in here. Remember, uh, I was doing like I, I was doing this before format total yada yada yada. But uh, uh, obviously, I mean I don't know why I didn't do it before. This is just way cleaner. So I changed all of our um, all of our previous days to be like that. Um, we deleted uh, again. I, I sort of mentioned this quickly in the beginning. We deleted this. But not really, because what we did was so this is the regular source day three is now the fast version. And the version I coded live on stream uh, is in this alternatives folder, and it's sort of not hooked up to our library at all, but it's just there. Um, so I, th I think this is going to be fine. Git diff. Sure. Sure. Oh, this is like replacing that file with uh, making version 2 be the, the regular version, basically. Uh, and that was deleting, yeah. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Uh... Oh, I, I changed this just because I didn't like the wording, but that's a tiny little change to uh, day four. Um, I also moved, uh, this doesn't change the code or anything, but I moved this like up in the function. Uh, oh, and parse digits, uh, we, now, we now are parsing digits um, the new, better way. Um, and that's it. All right, so git add all git commit m day 5 git push all right um, let's make sure it got up there and then after that I'm going to sign off day 5 is up day 5 we got our computer. Um, okay. Well, that's that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Um, again, I don't know how much I'm gonna be able to keep up this sort of pace. Uh, I might not. Uh, I might have to skip a couple days or whatever because I've been spending a lot of time on this. I didn't realize how much of a project it would be to stream, but it's been a fun sort of thing to do. Um, it's uh, it's a nice challenge to code uh, and record at the same time. Uh, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be, um, but it's fun. So hopefully somebody, some of you get um, some, are learning from this, um, learning about Rust. I think it's a great language, and um, uh, I, I just enjoy it a whole lot, and uh, hopefully, you know, some of the things I'm doing are things that you've never um, seen before, and so it'll help you write better code in Rust. And uh, with that, I'm, I'll sign off. Thanks.